Thanks, you guys, for having me. Thanks for taking your lunch break today. I'm glad it's an intimate group. So it's really helpful for me. I don't know that I'm going to be bringing any big, broad ideas. Hopefully, I'm rekindling ideas you've heard before and that that can be new perspective for you to get you back on track, re-energize, and push you to be the best you for 2023. So if I'm saying something and it's redundant or you've heard all that, just roll your eyes. I'll see you out there. And it'll tell me, move along, move along, move along. Um, I do work at the Bridgeway Hospital. I'm the CEO there. I'm also a licensed certified social worker and have been for a lot of years now. I won't, I won't share, almost 20. And um, the Bridgeway has been here 40 years, though. We were the first freestanding psychiatric facility in the state, and we're still in your backyard over in North Little Rock providing inpatient, outpatient care. So um, while they're honing in on that mental health, you know, that's the service we provide, and we're accelerating that business to meet the needs of our community. Uh, so reach out if you'd like to come and tour, if you think it'd be helpful for your employees, if you're looking for something for yourself, I'd love to chat with you about that. All right, so let's get to the topic for today. New year, let's do you. Um, so to get us started, um, it kind of made me think as we were getting the timing right for this one about the new year. People make resolutions. Do you guys set some goals for this year? Absolutely. You probably made some of those business goals on a lot of people that work with are entrepreneurs. You probably made some personal goals. How are you feeling about your goals? I like that. If you don't feel as confident and you're shaking your head, it's okay because research tells us by mid-February, we all begin to fizzle out. So it was sort of timely that this uh, paired up. So I thought it would be really useful for us today to talk about some of those productivity features that really help us to push ourselves to the next one. But before I do that, anybody have any guesses about how New Year's resolutions came about? Wild guess. I had to look this one up too because I started thinking about it afterwards. It was the Babylonians, if you believe that. So it's actually, they started some 4,000 years ago ringing in the new year and they did 11 day festival in March. And then by 46 BC, Roman Empire, Julius Caesar moved the first day of the year to January 1st. And finally, Pope Gregory, he brought the January 1st new year back to vogue when the Gregorian calendar began that concept. And the origin of making those resolutions also started with the Babylonians, and they reported that they wanted to make promises to the gods in hopes that they would earn favor in the coming year. And one of their favorite hopes that they would set up to the gods was to pay off debts, which interestingly enough, is also one of the most popular New Year's resolutions today. So if back in 46 BC, we were wanting to pay off debts and it is 2023 and we have that as a high one, what does that really say about our successful goals? I know. So we set up today's program to make sure whatever your goals were, you could get to that success by the end of 2023. So by the time we leave today, I'm hoping you'll know a little bit about productivity and what its pitfalls are. We're going to get some strategies for getting it all done. I'm going to talk about two in particular. And if you don't like those, there's tons of other you can go research. We're going to talk about some work-life balance, how to have it, how to plan it, and then grab a few workarounds because nothing is perfect. It's an imperfect world. I want to make sure that you have every tool possible to get you there. And then finally, I'm going to spend a smidge of time on health and wellness because those kind of things are mostly reminders because I think those are the stuff you would probably roll your eyes out at me. So let's get started with that first area. Let's talk about productivity, because really, if you're starting to fizzle out, it may be because you're starting to see a decline in that productivity. And it seems like productivity should be easy to gather, right? So you hear the news and it says something like the workforce productivity is up. Does that really mean much to you? Does that mean your personal productivity is up? That type of big measure is usually an aggregate of all the output of all of the workers. We're looking at what goods and services have been produced. And those macro trends don't have much to do with your personal productivity as a person. Even more so than that, we're no longer machine operators as they were. Most of us are skilled knowledge workers. So the production is not always something that is easy to count. It's your own time, it's your own energy. So based off those thoughts, there are two types of productivity. There's that workforce productivity, that big macro number, and personal productivity. Everything I'm going to talk about today is going to be the, the latter. 
because you have a hundred percent control over what your personal productivity is, but you might have a lot of trouble trying to bit, make that big aggregate number push out. That is a little bit harder to define um, and it can be very individualized and personalized in its meaning. So Ray Dalio, he's an American billionaire and investor hedge fund manager. He really emphasized the importance of productivity. He has an explainer video called How the Economic Machine Works. You're going to get a copy of these slides and you'll notice I put it down here for you. It's 30 minutes, so you're not going to watch it today. But the thing that I pulled out of that that I think is his best piece of advice is he says, do all that you can to raise your productivity because in the long run, that's what really matters most. So those benefits of increasing your productivity are very clear. You're going to work on the right things at the right time, and you're going to get better results because of it. And that's how we really realize growth. There are three additional benefits you're going to get from productivity. The first is innovation. The modern day life and work has been about change, but the pace of change has substantially increased in this 21st century. Technologies increased our productivity, but the reverse is also true. Our productivity leads to more innovation, more technology, and then we are able to innovate even more. It, it pumps out our creative juices. It also brings you self-confidence. Um, we know that when you know what your strengths are and you play to your strengths and you feel more confident, you're actually more productive. So if you compare yourself with the things you're doing well, you're going to get better results. And then higher engagement. If you like what you're doing, you're going to be more passionate about it. You're going to want to do it. You're going to really jump in there. The research on productivity is very robust. You can go out and find it yourself, but you don't need scientific experience experiments to really figure this out. Try some of these tools. And if you notice that your work, your energy, your reward, your happiness increase, that's the tool for you. That's the one you should stick with. That's how you can make it personally identified for you. Now, unfortunately, there are going to be some pitfalls. Not everything is going to be perfect. You're going to find some things that hit you. One of them is distractions, and your workplace is the number one setting for those distractions. You usually can't go but more than five minutes in a workplace setting before a distraction hits, whether that's your email pinging, someone dropping by your door, someone um, IMing you on Teams. All those distractions get to us. Even your dog barking counts as it now. The second one is cognitive intrusions. So everybody in this room could probably agree that in order for you to really push yourself forward, you got to have rest. You got to clear your mind. You got to disconnect yourself. Now, when you really go out into the world and do that disconnection, how disconnected are you? Most of us have cognitive intrusions. You don't want to think about work, but it comes to your mind. And once it comes to your mind, you keep thinking about work, right? And so your disconnection is harder and harder to do, and it becomes a productivity pitfall for you. The third one's personal reasons. Um, some of us have decided to do condensed work weeks. So you're doing more hours in less amount of days. Sounds ideal, right? but it is not always ideal. You have fewer hours each evening to do those personal items that come up. So if personal life gets out of balance, you have a harder and harder time making that work. You'll find that's especially true right now with people doing hybrid workplaces because you'll have meetings all day long, but you decided to work from home because the plumber's coming by and that took more time than you expected. So those personal reasons pop up and become a pitfall. Another one's just not enough training. Technology and things are moving so fast that we can't be the best at everything. So we can see some of our productivity fail because we're having to take the time to learn different or new skills to excel we're at. So all of these challenges can be solved, though, by looking at some productivity skills that are there. It's important to be aware of what's standing in your way from becoming the most productive self. So dig deep. These are not the whole list of pitfalls. Maybe there's a few more you need to add on here for yourself. But let's dig into a couple of common ways you might be able to move forward. Work-life balance. So the Cambridge Dictionary, it defines the work-life balance as the amount of time you're spending doing your job compared with the amount of time you spend with your family and doing things you enjoy. But we found that a lot of people are shying away from this term work-life balance and instead using the word work-life integration. And if you think about it, now is the time for that. I mentioned earlier that hybrid workforce. Never before has it been so in your face that your work 
and your, your personal life are tied together. You cannot compartmentalize in the way we used to. In doing that, there's an intersection between our work and our personal life. There are aspects of your personal life that can intersect family, leisure, health, that then is bi-directional because your work can interfere with your personal life as well. So it's going both directions. Um, how does that really work though? How can we change that up? So work-life integration is not just a plan. It's going to be a cycle. So there are a few steps you can go through, but you can't think of it like, great, I have perfectly balanced my work and life because things will maneuver and change and you're going to need to rebalance again. So think now of your work-life integration or your work-life balance as a constant cycle that you're trying to perfect. Don't get down on yourself if it's out of balance. That might be appropriate for the time that you're in and you can recycle. So to do this well, the first thing to do is consider what your goals and your feelings are. And when you look at that, think about what your personal goals and feelings are about work. Unfortunately, it's very easy for us to slide back into business as usual. And our culture at work is to push the idea that you should work all the time. It is more hours will produce more items. Research doesn't really support that, but our culture does. So consider journaling to do a really intense deep dive into what you stand for right now. Maybe getting to that neck rung of the corporate ladder is important to you. And so adding those extra hours in deference to those hobbies that you used to spend a great time with, that might work for your cycle at this moment in time. If you're beginning to feel some burnout, maybe this is not that part of the cycle. Maybe you need to rebalance and instead spend more time on those things that you enjoy instead. The second thing is you can't do it all. You're going to have to pick. I know that is hard, but you'll hear us say again, pick a few goals in each of those primary areas, not all the goals. One idea is that it would be very difficult to save and invest simultaneously. Maybe right now you want to save a lot for the idea that you're going to invest that money in the future. Despite the resounding evidence, we tend to work long, long hours, and it can be harmful both to us as employees or if you are the employer. Many professionals still really struggle to overcome their assumptions and deeply ingrained habits around work hours. So what is it going to take for you to free yourself from that unhappy and healthy pattern? Maybe as part of this work-life balance, you set a goal that you're going to use your PTO this year. Because I know some of y'all let some roll right over or maybe even take a vacation. <laughs> the last one is establish boundaries. It is really important and crucial for you to set up some of those items and then communicate them. So for instance, one of my boundaries is that unless it's an emergency, I'm not going to respond to emails, texts, or calls after hours. But I've communicated that to my whole team. So they've already reduced how much they send to me during that time frame so that they can honor it. Or they might preface an email with, I know you're at home right now. We can talk tomorrow. So setting that up helps you to deliver that boundary very well and not feel as guilty when it comes up. Now, like we talked about that work-life balance, it's a cycle. You're going to have to refine it. You're periodically going to have to look at it. That's a really integral part of really developing that balance for yourself. There is no perfect. You're going to move around a lot. All right. So the next phase. We want to get it all done. And there are a ton of productivity apps and applications you can do. I'm going to talk about two simple ones today because they're very popular. And one of them is one that I use. So I'll get passionate about it. I'm going to first start with the Eisenhower Matrix. This one is extremely popular. And it was brought up by Stephen Covey um, in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it just took off. It's basic. It's simple. It's a good starter pack if you haven't done that. So um, Dwight D. Eisenhower was our 34th president of the United States. That's another trivia fact. I'm trying to store those up for you guys. He served as a general in the United States Army. He was an Allied Forces Supreme Commander during World War II. He was a NATO First Supreme Commander. So he made a lot of tough choices, continuously had to make choices, and he had to focus in his energies. It is said that he invented this world famous Eisenhower principle, and it would help him to prioritize by urgency and importance. Pretty simple things. 
So the tax fall into four categories. And you'll notice up here, while that wasn't part of his original principle, they are numbered because I'm going to give you a tip based on that. But the first one is those items that are urgent and important. That's block number one. So these are the priority tasks. You need to do them immediately, especially if they take a very small amount of time. The second block is not urgent, but they are important. So you're going to schedule those, commit to doing them. You know you're going to need them. The number three block, these are not important, but they are urgent. So you may want to delegate these to someone else. And the last one is not urgent and not important. So these are tasks you could eliminate altogether. Um, you don't want any of your team spending time on it. So I know one thing that always comes up when you first see this is it says to delegate. And you might think, well, I don't have a personal assistant, so who shall I delegate all these items to? But he actually uses this prioritization for every section of your life, not just your work. So everything. So that delegation could be things that you balance at home between roles, between your kids, your spouse, your partner. It also may be things that you delegate out to other people in this, that you have them help you with or service with. So at home, it's easy to think about. It's difficult for you to get to cleaning. That's obviously something that is urgent, but maybe less important in your task of things that day. Maybe you have a housekeeper. So you're delegating some of those tasks off of your plate any way you look at it. It's very simple, but I mentioned that um, the numbers become important. So one task that works for this is that if you're doing your to-do list, you do not need to keep up with four different lists. You're going to keep a running tally as things come up, but you're going to number them based on the importance. So you'll memorize the one, two, three, four. Obviously, number ones are going to be the most important. So you can just look through your list after you tallied them to all the number ones and get those done first, then look for number twos. That helps with organization, keeps it very basic, and very simple. Um, putting it all down on paper does free your mind. So in all of the strategies, they recommend that. Your brain is not a good office space. Get it out of your brain, put it onto paper. Uh, try limiting, though, each of these sections to about, about eight tasks. Do a parking lot for those other items and bring them onto the list as you finished up different sections. Otherwise, it gets very overwhelming to consider those items. Um, don't let others distract you. Define your priorities, and they may be different than someone else's. Plan your morning, plan your stuff, and do what you can to reduce false interruptions. And do not procrastinate. Find that momentum. You can get a little bit overwhelmed and start overmanaging your list instead of actually doing the action items on the list. So don't think about it too much. Just do the next thing on the list and keep moving along. Um, Eisenhower Matrix is a really good option if you struggle with initial prioritization of items, if you know that's a lacking for yourself or a challenge. It allows you to keep all those priorities in one place, whether that's work, hobby, or home, and you're keeping it limited, eight items at a time, moving things on and off your lists. So pretty simple. Okay, the next one, though, is get things done. Sometimes people use more colorful language to describe this based on a book by David Allen. And I love this one uh, because it's what I use. I've used for a lot of years. And um, he actually did this TED talk and he was talking, I think it was at Cambridge at the time in the TEDx. And he tells this story about him going with his girlfriend at the time to this island and they anchor the boat and are going to stay there overnight, but the winds pick up. And uh, they're quite scared. In fact, they lose the anchor altogether. And there's a rocky uh, area right beside them that they could blow into. Call the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard says, hey, our, our high weather boat is, is at least three hours out. The adrenaline pops in. But at some point in the night, while the adrenaline's there and they're waiting for that boat to come and rescue them, they look up and the full moon is the biggest it's ever been. And it almost gives them the sense of calm in the storm as they sit there. The GTD is built to provide you the calm in the storm. There are going to be things, input coming at you all of the time, and you got to find the Zen in that. How can you organize all of the buckets that are coming into you so that you know that you are picking up the thing that's most important to get done? So it's a very popular task management system too. find lots of stuff on YouTube, um, and you can look up his TED Talks. It's based on the simple fact, the more information bouncing around inside your head, the harder it is to decide where your attention should go. 
So you spend more time thinking about the tasks instead of getting on the action of it. And this is going to build up stress, overwhelm, uncertainty, anxiety. So I mentioned before, your head's a lousy area for that. So we can't process that much information. You have to dump all of that out. So the very first step in GTD is capture all of the information. Just start writing everything down. Do a complete brain dump. Anything that comes up, personal, uh, professional, everything goes down. Don't worry, this list could range from 30 items to 100 items. And it's not uncommon for people to start writing things and suddenly a subtle other thing comes to mind and you just need to jot that down. Very common. But you're going to get all of that set out. The second is to clarify. So now you need to break these down. What are things that you can do in two minutes or less? Get it done. Just move forward on the action. Anything that's going to take two steps or more of action items is now going to be moved over into that organized list. It's a project that you want to get through. Then you're going to organize those projects. You want to block off time. You want to write out those action steps. You'll notice on a lot of to-do lists, it may say something like, mom, send bill. Those are not real action items. So he suggests that we take some time and really break down what is the action, write it out. Um, for instance, even something very simple like calling a friend for their birthday. That's easy to put on the calendar. We know it's an action item. It's time limited. We can block off that time. But if you think to yourself in the moment you put that on your calendar that you don't have that friend's phone number anymore and you're going to probably have to reach out to somebody else to get it. Now that's multiple steps. So instead of waiting for that day and thinking, I need to call Mike on his birthday, I want to think right now, do I need to get Mike's phone number? I could work on that right now. And that way I'm not time pressed or waiting for something and can get it done when the time actually happens for it. Then you're going to review. You're going to frequently look over, update, revise, look at those lists. And then you've got to engage, get the actual work done. So I'm simplifying it quite a bit here. If you read his book, he has a very um, intricate system to lay out and you can manipulate it to work for you. So I'm going to give you just a teeny bit of what works for me. So I have got, um, I block my calendar off and I chunk things together from looking at my lists. So for instance, emails, if I know I need to respond to multiple people's emails, they're going to be grouped together on my task list. So I can put them onto my calendar at the time because I'm already in my email. I'm already motivated toward that. And I've already got my mind moving that direction. I don't have to move between tasks to get that done. So then I have this whole little list, smaller task list of those things that need to happen. And I put that together. Now through my day, although I've blocked it and I've connected things, there's going to be more input coming in. If it comes to me and I can do it right then very quickly, I just get it done. Just do it right then. If it's going to require me to have multiple steps, gather more information or do something else, I put it into a box, literally a box on my desk because a lot of paper comes in. If it's not, it's electronic. I have a task list going and I can uh, connect that task list. Then at the end of my week, I look back and what's in that inbox and I start to pull it out. Is that something I need to maybe just put in as reference? Do I put that into my parking lot? Is it something that's going to go on my calendar? After you dig in and start working with it, you'll find that although lots of information is coming in, now that I've got these things organized, I can quickly make a decision about which section that I want them to go to. So I have a little notebook. I still do it really low tech with paper, if you can imagine. And I just add those to my paper notebook. But if you are total tech, don't worry. There are things to help you out with that. And there are applications in Google where you can use sticky notes and have different color sticky notes to represent different lists for yourself. You can use your reminders app and make them different colors in order for you to list. So you can go very low tech, very high tech. You can modify the lists or the way that you organize reference materials to how your mind works. So I like get things done because it has flexibility with a little bit of structure for me. And getting things done could be good for you if you feel overwhelmed by the amount of things that you have to keep track of. And you're trying to keep a running list in your mind. And at the end of the day, you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't call that person back. GTD is for you. If you worry about forgetting small details, if you wear a lot of hats, multiple projects going on, GTT is the way to go for that, especially if you've ever had trouble finishing your projects as you go through. 
All right. Doesn't matter which productivity you choose, uh, pr productivity application you choose, even a different one I didn't discuss. These workarounds are things that usually work collaboratively with those and some ideas to just get you organized and move through. So if you're thinking, gosh, I got a great productivity app that I'm already using, maybe one of these tips will be it. The Pomodoro uh, technique. Anybody heard of this one? So Pomodoro is actually in reference to um, the little tomato shaped timer. So the inventor had connected those together. So the reason this method works really simple, it's evolutionary biology. The human brain cannot focus on a ta single task for a great amount of time. Our brains are just not meant for that. We're meant for survival. So we'll get distracted. We want to protect ourselves and our brain from some looming threat or state of alertness. So you just get more and more difficulty as the time moves forward for your brain. Research by Alejandro Lairas from the University of Illinois showed that deactivating and reactivating work allows us to stay focused. So taking those breaks actually improved workflow. When you're completing long tasks like studying for exams or making presentations, writing a report, doing your research, you need to take short and planned breaks throughout. So that's why these five minute breaks work so well. So his method indicates that you would work for 25 minutes and take a four minute, I'm sorry, five minute break. Forgive me. Take your break seriously, though. It should be seen as a reward. You should get up from the space that you're in and do it somewhere else. This is meant to help you stretch, get that cup of coffee, um, reframe yourself. So it's important that you actually do the break. While there's not a hard and fast rule for the 25 minutes, and it is recommended that you, you do 25 minutes, a five minute break, do four cycles, and you would take a longer break at 15 minutes. And a lot of the research is based on that. But people have trialed out different amounts. For instance, they may do 30 minutes with a five minute break, 40 minutes with a five minute break. Anything above 45 minutes tends to show lower production for you. So 45 is about your max. After 45 minutes, you want to get up, you want to get that break, you really want to move through. Now, there are some times that you would want to consider that 45 minutes, you can get in the flow, that momentum's happening, you get that rush, you've got that zen, that might be a time that even though you plan to stop at the 25 minute mark, you would push yourself a little bit further, because you know you've just got that pumping going. If you want to try the Pomodoro technique, there are a few things that could help. You can use an old school egg timer like he did here, tomato shaped, obviously, but there's some apps that do it for you. There's the 3030. Um, there's one called Be Focused, and it lets you um, alter the time. So you could do any amount of time, and then it tells you what the break is and pops when your breaks are. Assign just one task during that 25 minute interval. We'll talk more about that in later, but you want to think about tasks that are related for 25 minutes and to the best of your ability, pick something that can get accomplished in 25 minutes. Never, never, never skip the break. Like I said, if you're in the Zen, you may push out your break, but don't skip it. You need that. Don't check your email during your break. That's not a real break, right? You want to be mindful. Take your break at a different location. I mean, even today, I see you guys checking on your phone. I get it. But I know you're checking your emails right now. It's hard for us to focus on one thing. And the goal here is that if you can um, focus on one thing, you would do more of it at a time. Um, take that 15-minute break after four intervals. And do not accept interruptions or false emergencies in that, that break. So you've got to figure out what are you going to allow yourself? It could be that you close your door completely and you have a sign up at what time you'll finish um, to kind of give cues for people that would that that interruption is not welcomed at that point in time. Also, set yourself a daily go. So how many 25 minute sections are you going to work up to? Do you want to try to do 12 today and you've blocked it off on your calendar? Um, that's 300 minutes of productive work because then you could look at your list and say, gosh, look how much I really did get done by using this method instead of getting distracted and pulled away from all of those other items. All right. Another tool or tip is time blocking. Do you have a list of priorities or goals that you want to achieve this year? but you struggle with allocating time, time blocking might be the answer for you. 
Cal Newton was the author of a work called a book called Deep Work. And one of the things I liked most about that book is where he talks about a 40 hour time blocked work week and his estimate produces the same amount of output as a 60 plus hour work week if it's pursued without structure. So the more we structure our time, the more effective we are and you need less time to do more things just because of that lack of distraction and everything is allocated and set out for you. If there's one thing that can be said about a more modern workplace, though, is you don't have control of your schedule. Even if you're not in a traditional office building, there's somebody looking at your schedule, adding things to it, isn't there? All the time. So um, if you don't control that schedule, it will control you. Time blocking allows you to look at your week ahead and start blocking the time, preventing people from grabbing those moments that you may need to accomplish the tasks that you have. So this little bit of prep work ahead improves your overall production for the rest of the week. There are a couple close cousins though to uh, time blocking. One of them is called task batching. And that's when you group similar tasks together, especially if they're only going to take you 25 minutes or less. And I gave that example earlier of if you have to respond to several emails or send several emails, you're going to group that in one time block together rather than spreading that out. Um, and that's really helping saving you time with mental energy. You're already on the email. You're already focused on that. You're already on a spreadsheet. You can already get that done. And you want to try to think about email in particular in smaller blocks rather than um, looking at it every time it pings. So my strategy is to try to do a 20 minute block in the morning, a 20 minute block midday and a 20 minute block in the evening. And I ask people if they sent me an urgent email to text me in between. And I just try not to look at it until I hit those time blocks. And then I dedicate, I roll through them and I get things on my task list or schedule them out for right later in the week if they take more than one step that I can get you through. Um, another option is day theming. It kind of uh, is what it sounds like, but especially if you're an entrepreneur, there's a lot of different hats you'll be wearing in the beginning. You may have responsibilities like um, you have human resources. Um, you need to do customer support. You need product development. So you may decide to theme each day and block your time based on that theme instead. I haven't used that one as much in my work, but I can see if you were beginning a business because you don't have all of those those business portions equaled out, that might be a very good effect for you. But another one I do is called time boxing. It sounds like time blocking, but there is a subtle difference between the two. Time boxing asks you to impose a limit on how much time you'll dedicate to a specific task. So instead of me putting on my calendar that I'm going to um, write from nine to 10 in the morning, I would instead um, say, I'm going to, um, I'm going to work on, instead of saying I work on a writing from nine to 10 in the morning, I would say, I'm going to see how much I can get done between nine and 10. You're going to limit yourself. You're going to box in the time. I'm going to stop at that point. Even if I'm not done, I'm walking away from that activity. You're limiting it when you do time boxing. That makes sense. All right, so working, though, is not the same as making progress. So time blocking helps you improve your focus so that you can do the meaningful things that you want to get done in the day, things that actually impact your life. You've already thought about it, and you've planned ahead, and you know what those goals are. And that keeps you doing it the right time at the right pace for relevant activities. But you're going to tell me that there are a lot of successful people that tell you that they don't use their calendar at all, and they work four hours a day, and they get everything done. I would uh, hearken that they are probably the exception and not the rule as it goes through. If you let your calendar set out there, and some of you may be doing that right now, your time is being stolen from you. So Stephen Pressfield has a famous analogy in his book, The War on Art, um, for getting things done. And he says, the amateur only works when inspiration strikes. The pro sits down every day and puts in steady work. Time blocking is your steady work. It's not a regular. It's not extreme. It's not one edge or the other. You're going to think about what it was on your GTD list, and you're going to put it into your time blocks and get things done. You want to try uh, time blocking if you have to juggle a lot of different projects and responsibilities. If you feel like you're spending a lot of time in reactive mode, 
instead of responding to what's going on in your environment, this is a good option for you. If you find your day is extraordinarily chopped up between meetings, especially if you don't have control over some of those, time blocking is a good one for you. Um, people often pick meetings based on what's available on the calendar. Don't make yourself available by your time blocking. If you're battling constant interruptions throughout the day or you struggle to find that mental space to have the big picture, you may block time literally to think because you need that time in order to produce that, that high level knowledge that goes there. Um, kind of going hand in hand to that before I go to the next one is when the interruptions come, I said, you don't want to use false interruptions, right? How do you figure that out? There are some things and strategies you can do that can help you come right back to where you're at. So for instance, they say, if you continue to look at the computer screen while someone's at your door, it often alludes to them that now's not a good time. You can be verbally assertive. Hey, can I get back to you in about 20 more minutes? I'm just going to knock this out and then I can call you right away. Um, other strategies include highlighting the last thing that you read on your screen because it can draw your eyes right back and help you to get synced right in where you need to be. So that's some thoughts as you go through that process. All right, next up is monotasking. Super simple, right? Monotasking. It's a single task, the practice of dedicating oneself to a given task, minimizing potential interruptions until the task is completed or a significant period of time has elapsed. Monotasking contrasts with multitasking, which is dividing one's focus and attention. So don't let the simplicity of this tool get to you. It's actually one of the hardest things to implement in your life. Think about it. When was the last time you sat and watched TV without double screening it? Some people even triple screen it. You know, they have their iPad, they have their phone, they have their, their TV on. I know we all do it. We do it. You know, it, it, it may be even quadruple, but really what the research and neuroscience tells us is that the brain doesn't really do tasks simultaneously. And um, we hoped it would, but it just doesn't. In fact, we switch tasks quite quickly. And each time we move, let's say for instance, hearing music to writing text, talking to someone, there's this start and stop process that happens in the brain. And after a while, that start and stop process can get kind of tough for our brains. And so rather than saving time, it costs time. I'm not going to take you through this exercise today, but you can do it on your home, in your home later. Test this out for me. So you would draw two horizontal lines on a piece of paper. On the first line, you would uh, carry out the first task, which you just write, I am a great multitasker. On the second line, you would write numbers one through 20. Time yourself doing those two lines. Draw two more lines, except this time, I want you to write one letter of I am the great multitasker and one number, one after the other, go back and forth, back and forth. On average, your time more than doubles. So we're really not great at multitasking. Research by Gloria Mark at the University of California, Irvine, found that it takes an average of 23 minutes and 15 seconds to return to original task if you've had a significant interruption. 23 minutes and 15 seconds. It sounds crazy because you think about all the multi things that you do in a day, but if you are sitting and you are absorbed and knocking out work at your desk and someone comes in, sits down and has a conversation, can you jump right back into the, the flow that you were in? That's the 23 minutes that gets us. Observers going to workplaces monitored and timed people's activities and found employees were switching between tasks on average every three minutes and five seconds, and that roughly half of these were self-interruptions. So you have a thought, oh, I got to get that done, and you swap yourself. And this is a problem because when we attempt to do two things at once, we end up doing both half as well as we really could. Thatcher Wine wrote a book called The 12 Monotasks, Do One Thing at a Time to Do Everything Better. I do recommend it, but it repeats the advice over and over again. Since we need to hear things seven times, it's not going to hurt you to hear it, but it tells us we have to be fully present in the moment in order to absorb that information. Turning off and putting away your phone, clearing your schedule of commitments, sitting and dressing comfortably and focusing in. And this means you shouldn't be distracted by multiple goals either. Have one for each of your primary areas of your life and focus on that one major area. 
So you wouldn't want to write a book and a blog post at the same time. Pick one until it's done and move to the next, and you're likely to get it done faster and better. Learn one skill at a time to get that mastery. For your health, either bring, bring on strength or bring on endurance. You may not be able to do both at the same time. All right, sounds good. You want to focus in one thing at a time. Everybody agrees monotasking is probably a good idea. So get right after it, right? So most of us have to train our brains to focus on one thing at a time, and it's more challenging than we even put ourselves into. So you want to first focus on that muscle. You want to change your mindset, go from, I want everything to, I appreciate what I have. That's going to help you determine what those absolute goals are. And this is where some of those health ideas come in. So we talked about mindfulness earlier that trains your brain to do monotasking. It will actually help you be more productive, not just in your personal life, not just in reducing your stress, but even at work to get more things done by having that focus. So here's a couple of ideas, easy stuff you can do to practice your monotasking. Go for a walk without listening to music. Dun, dun, dun. Put your phone on do not disturb or airplane mode and while you're working in those chunks of time, whether you're time blocking or you're doing the Pomodoro. Just be present when you're working on a single task. Don't pick up any other conversations. When you're sitting in a meeting, try not to pick up your phone the whole time. Have your team put their phone in a basket so they don't have that impulse. Absolutely, monotasking is right for everybody. You may have fallen into the trap of thinking you're great at multitasking. People even put it on their resume. Uh, I would hearken that you don't want to be good at multitasking. You want to be good at monotasking, getting things done very well, quickly, and efficiently because you're good at that. Okay, I'm going to try to get through one thing. You guys are going to get these slides, and so you'll get this information. But more tech does not always equal more productivity. I mentioned moving that through. So um, I would just give a quick reminder before we go to question and answer that when you get a new application, you're thinking about a new thing, think back to yourself. What's this really going to be useful for? How will it really provide happiness, motivation, change in my life? Is it necessary? Those extra tools as we come through often are not very helpful to us in the long run. There is a diminishing return, a critical point, and it comes back to Medcalf's law. Medcalf's law is an, a, a, a mathematical equation, and it says that as technology moves up, and he was actually talking about fax machines, that's how old this law is that one fax machine is not helpful, right? You need multiple to come through. But when you get too many, there's a critical point where you don't give a diminishment of the returns. The same is true for any technology that we're seeing. So just because it's techy, just because it's great, doesn't mean it's useful for you. So look at all of those applications on your phone. Which one are you really using all the time? Which one is really keeping you organized and getting you there? Those are the ones you put your energy into and push off some of the others. All right, I know I'm at 12.51. I'm going to open up for a few questions and answers. Like I said, I, I, um, I think I went a little um, over talking about a couple of subjects. So you're going to get some slides of things that might prompt you to do a little extra research. And um, a couple of those were about healthy and wellness options, but I told you those are things that would be more reminders. Morning routine, evening routine, drink lots of water, get good sleep, eat healthy. Um, I can't express how important those things are, especially sleep. Adults need an average of eight hours. And most of the, in the U S I think it's maybe four and a half or five hours that we're getting. Um, so that would be an immediate way. You're going to find your mindfulness practice work better. Your productivity works better getting that kind of set up. All right. Is there a question I can answer for you guys? Sure. Oh, so she was asking with ADHD, is there a preference between? So there's a lot of uniqueness in the way that adult ADHD presents itself. Um, so don't, my, mine is more of a suggestion than a rule. Um, but with ADHD, that frontal cortex is usually the thing that it is most affected by it. And you tend to be more impulsive, racing thoughts and moving things through. So they need to have a lot of structure. 
So for that, I would say GTD is a great one. Um, maybe that's because it's my preference too. And I would suggest that they use time blocking and the Pomodoro together because um, they're going to need that. They want to block their time. They need to think about it ahead of time so they know exactly what they need to do. There's no question. You know exactly what the next action item is if you're doing GTD well. And then you know from what's time block on your calendar when you have set aside time to do that. Um, I find that sometimes with adult ADHD, they need some accountability with that calendar. So it can be helpful for them to batter off somebody kind of what their day looks like and what their time needs are until they kind of get that structure. But time blocking can be very helpful and set that timer. They don't have a lot of, um, they may not be able to determine. It feels like about 20 minutes and it has really been two hours, you know, that you see it in kids more often. Let's say they're playing video games and they're supposed to do it. Just 30 minutes and then they're cleaning your room, right? It's been two hours and you're back and there's no room clean. They can't tell the difference between 30 minutes and two hours. So using the actual timer of some kind is very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Change is hard. <laughs> I, I hear a business question in there too. I do. And I can talk to you a little bit about that afterwards because I think some processes to humanize what you're doing will help with that. But then I think Megan has a response yeah. from a time. Well, and I think what I'm hearing is that you're automating. That actually, as far as productivity can goes, can be very helpful for you because um, while that hands-on approach is great, you have a finite amount of hours to get things done in a day. So anything that could be automated can be helpful, but change is hard for people. So maybe there's a way to kind of get that middle ground for them to make that happen. But a lot of times with change, persistence is the key. If you can go back to our old habits, we do, that's us too. We often go back to those old habits. So a lot of times people will try to go back to that old habit, but if you keep helping them to move forward, you may see that change. And that happens in like big organizations, even with us, we'll change something simple like a form and someone will pull out an old form. You think they're all gone. You think you've shredded them all. You've eliminated, and then it comes back to haunt you. So I just think change can be hard. And maybe if you stay and persevere, but I do think you're, as far as productivity goes on the right path, if that is an item that you could automate, it seems wise that that could be one thing to get out off of your plate, get out of your brain, out of your mind, because it is hard to field all the phone calls while trying to do the engagement work that's necessary. Yeah, so, that's a good question. I have a question. I, I heard you mention some really, really for wonderful techniques. And sometimes I try to use time blocking, but it doesn't always work for me because I'm not the most disciplined person <laughs> in the world. What are some things that we can do to try to, I guess, hold ourselves accountable to what we say we're going to do. So we were talking about um, in monotasking that you have to focus your brain. You have to train your brain. We have some ingrained habits that come with work that we've all set up. So one of them is about that um, interaction that we have with others. So when someone comes to your door or to your cubicle or calls your phone, your inclination is to grab it because you want to please others. You're, all of us are servicing um, those around us. So you do have to retrain your brain some. 
So the very simple tips to start you out with that is I, everybody could benefit from mindfulness 15 minutes every day. I just think that that breathing is going to help you de-stress. There are lots of other benefits and it's going to start focusing your brain on the task at hand so that you don't feel the pull. The other thing is eliminate as many distractions as possible. If you have the availability to do a hybrid schedule, you might think about your week ahead and look at the task. And if you're having to time block big, deep areas of time to finish a project, for instance, maybe that's a day you could be at home. I run a hospital. I don't work from home. I go to the office every day. So for me, I have a door, I close my door and I've got a a marker on my door that tells you not to disturb right now. And it's just a visual cue for everybody else around me. And then I turn my phone so that I can't even hear it ring. Because if I hear my phone ring, if I hear it, see my text ding, I have that sense that I need to go and grab it. I mean, even during this presentation, my phone rang, I had to put it off on my wrist. It caused a distraction for me and had me off topic. So anything I can do and airplane mode, I find will make it stop on my watch too. So for me, airplane mode is what I would do during that time. Um, And that's helped to move through emergencies.